In the previous video, we reviewed what the home screen and summary grid are intended to display. Now in that example, I already had a predetermined well path and some rock property inputs just so that we could see what the shading looks like on the summary grid. But if you were starting up a new project file, what you would see is the system assumes a perfectly vertical well, and if you've assumed the default well board, it assumes that 13.38 casing is set at 5,000 feet, 9 and 5 eighths casing set at 20,000 feet, and the 7 inch liner is set at 23,000 feet. Completely arbitrary, just to get you started with some sort of basic well. If you were starting a new project, you would begin inputting key information, starting with the tabs on the left and working your way down, as you come to understand information about the project. Now, not all of the inputs are compulsory. For example, if we don't know what rig we're going to be using, then we don't need to put input information about the rig. But let's explore the rig builder right now. If we click on that tab, it pulls up a dialog screen that gives me opportunity to input information about key rig equipment and their systems. And we'll just start over here at the left where we can define the block weight of the rig. If you don't happen to know what rig you're using, then it's pretty useless to input block weight information. But if I have some idea, like let's say that the weight of the blocks is around 50,000 pounds, then I can type that in here, and it will actually be auto-populated for both the slack-off block weight and the rotating-off bottom block weight. If I happen to know that the slack-off block weight is higher than rotating, or that pickup block weight is lower than rotating, as is normally the case, then I can input that information here as well, and my plots will be corrected for those different block weights. Stand length is not currently used in the system, but later on in the future we will start using the length of the stand for different calculations. If you happen to know what the average stand length is, you can input it here, otherwise it really doesn't affect anything else in the program. The hoisting limit might come from the limitation of your draw works, it might come from the derrick, or it could come from a variety of different uh, hoisting equipment bottlenecks in the system. For example, on a jack-up rig, it might be the maximum load on your cantilever. But for right now, we'll just assume that I'm working with 500 ton hoisting equipment, which is 1,000 kips. Now, as a safety factor, I have a hoisting capacity percent input, and what that allows me to do is derate this rig manufacturer rating to within some safe operating margin. And by default, we assume that we're not going to operate above 90% of the rig manufacturer's rating. So this 1,000 kips would really become 900 kips or 900,000 pounds. We'll just end that message once and for all. The system pressure limit is a, an input that allows you to define what the maximum surface pressure is based on the limitations of your standpipe, Kelly hose, etc. When we're doing our hydraulic calculations, a vertical black line will appear on our pump pressure plots indicating where the limitation of the rig is. Background torque is similar to the block weight definition in the sense that when you're rotating with a top drive, very often, even when there's nothing connected to the string, if we're just rotating the quill freely in the air, some torque is registered on the torque gauge. It might only be 1,000 or two or 3,000 pounds, but it becomes important when we're trying to calibrate friction factors. If you happen to know what that background or ghost torque happens to be, you can input it here, otherwise just leave it at zero. The next input area is the top drive, where we can define what type of top drive the rig is using. And by default, we assume an NOV or Varco TDS4S, which is a very common top drive for many rigs. If that doesn't happen to be the top drive we're using, we can click the change button, which will pull up a library of several different common top drives used in the industry. Now, if I don't want to scroll through the entire library, I can just type in or start typing in the name of the manufacturer. For example, let's say that I'm using a can rig top drive, and I happen to know that it is a 1275. And by starting to type in these fields, it reduces the library down to the options that all are consistent with those inputs. So here I found the 1275 AC top drive. If I click on it, it will populate the specifications over here on the right. And just a quick check to confirm that these are indeed the torque limitations at different rotary speeds. Those values are going to be overlaid on my torque plots later on when I start doing calculations. And they'll be overlaid with a certain amount of derating. And by default, we assume that we won't oper operate at more than 90% of these manufacturer ratings. 
the nominal power and the type of the top drive are not used elsewhere in the program. They're just information for the user so that you know what the specifications are of the unit you're using. If I click OK, then the top drive type will be changed. If we move on over to the rig pumps, at the very top, you'll see that the surface equipment can be defined a variety of different ways. And by default, we assume that the surface equipment, and this is the distance of the piping from the pumps to the top drive, have a length of 300 feet and an ID of 4 inches. And that's just a completely arbitrary assumption. API 13D, which is a standard for the way hydraulics tend to be modeled throughout the industry, has predefined five different scenarios that you could also select from this drop-down menu. Now, if you don't happen to know what API 13D is assuming, we can pull that up real quick. And in section 7.3, they've defined a standpipe length and ID, a hose, the Kelly hose length and ID, a swivel length and ID, and of course the Kelly itself length and ID, along with some pressure drop constants. This is the equation that we use when we're calculating pressure drop through the surface equipment. That's what API 13D case 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 are referring to because many hydraulic programs in the industry use that same terminology. If you happen to know which category your rig falls into, you can easily select one of those options. The next box is the input of the pumps. And when I click on the definition of the pumps, by default, we assume that we have two Continental MSCO FB1600s, which are 1600 horsepower triplex pumps. I can edit the type of pumps that I'm using by clicking the edit box. And again, we see a long library list of different pumps. If I happen to know that I'm not using Continentals, let's say I'm using National or NOV 12 P160s, another very common pump. The specifications of that pump are summarized here on the right in terms of the stroke length, the number of cylinders, the manufacturer's rating, and what we've assumed as the maximum rating that the pump can be run at. Very rarely do you find rig contractors that are willing to run pumps over 100 strokes per minute, which happens to be 83% of the manufacturer rating in this particular case. If I happen to have sweet talk, talk the contractor and he's willing to run the pumps up to 110 strokes per minute by changing this field, it will recalculate the maximum flow that I can achieve with this pump. The other inputs are also used for calculating the pressure and flow rate limits for the pump. I'm going to go back and change this to 100 strokes per minute and click OK. Now, for that pump, I've got a series of different liner options that I can choose to display on my pump pressure plots. For example, if I want to see the impact of using either 6-inch liners or 6.5-inch liners, I want to check these boxes accordingly. If I'm using some non-standard or uncommon size liner, that can also be specified here by clicking the custom box and typing in the size of liner that I want to simulate, in this case, 6 and a quarter. If I click on the number of pumps, then this field will be recalculated and generated to display how much flow per pump and what is the maximum pressure that the system can operate at, given the specifications that I've defined. If I happen to be using more than two pumps, I can click on this field and change to the requisite number of pumps that are used. Now, you notice that this table was not updated because we're only summarizing or calculating the limitation of any one individual pump. So I would have to multiply these figures by however many pumps I'm using in the flow rate column to determine the total flow capacity of the pumps. I'm going to go back to two pumps here. This concludes how we set up our primary rig component inputs.